Good afternoon and welcome to another Waukegan History Museum Lunch and Learn. This is Ty Rohr coming to you from Waukegan, Illinois. I'm the Manager of Cultural Arts for the Waukegan Park District and the Waukegan Historical Society. Hope everyone out there is doing well. I picked today's topic because it is a story about the opposite of social distancing. This is a story about kids getting together at a camp for the two best weeks of the year. The story takes place in beautiful and historic Bowen Park. I guarantee that after today's story, you will never look at Bowen Park the same way ever again. Now, Bowen Park is open during these times with the exception of the playground and facilities. There is still so much more to offer in that park though, so I encourage you to visit that when you can. Now, this story would not be possible without the influence of two very special women, Jane Addams and Louise DeCoven Bowen. I will start today by introducing you to Louise DeCoven Bowen. Louise de Coven Bowen was born on February 26, 1859 in Chicago. She was the granddaughter of Fort Sheridan pioneers and the only child of John and Helen de Coven. Her family was one of the wealthy elites of Chicago at the time. She gained her large inheritance from her maternal grandfather, who had built a large fortune from real estate that later became the heart of Chicago's downtown. Bowen's social work began when she was eight years old. She witnessed a runaway horse crush an underprivileged girl on Michigan Avenue. She followed the men who took the young child to the girl's home. There, Bowen was shocked to see the living conditions of the poor. So moved by what she experienced, Bowen went door to door among the fashionable homes in Chicago and collected $57.50 for the girl's family. And in 1867, that was quite a lot of money. At the age of 16, she was an honor graduate of the Dearborn Seminary. She was one of 12 to graduate with honors. After graduating, she embarked on church work to fulfill her interest in community work. She taught a Sunday school class of boys in need of guidance and direction. For the next 11 years, she continued to teach the Sunday school class while also visited the boys' homes to learn about their circumstances. She assisted with finding jobs for the boys through her network of friends and even invited the boys to her home to play billiards. This eventually led to her establishing and running the first Chicago's Boys Club. In 1886, at the age of 27, she married Joseph Tilton Bowen who was a prominent manufacturer and banker, and they went on to have four children. While a young mother, Bowen became a board member and then president of Maurice Porter Memorial Hospital. Soon after, she became vice president of the Women's Board of St. Luke's Hospital and president of the Women's Board of Passivant Hospital. Louise Coven Bowen was a very close friend to American social reformer and philanthropist and philanthropist Jane Addams. They first met in 1893 when Adams invited Bowen to join the ne newly formed Hull House Women's Club. Adams wanted Bowen to teach the club how to use parliamentary procedures at the club's meetings. Bowen, though, first had to learn parliamentary procedures. Bowen and Adams became very close friends, and Bowen continued her involvement with the Whole House Women's Club for the next 17 years. While in the club, she gained her public speaking expertise and also a better understanding of contemporary issues. The Whole House Women's Club membership continued to expand, and Bowen helped Jane Adams and the Whole House trustees fund a new building called Bowen Hall to house an auditorium and library for use by the club. In 
The whole house settlement, located on the west side of Chicago in a poverty-stricken area, was founded by Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr on September 18, 1889. Whole House became a center of social reform and cultural activity for the women and children who went there for classes in sewing, music, drama, weaving, and more. By 1911, it had grown into a 13-building complex, which included a dining hall and gymnasium. Louise de Coven Bowen became a major financial contributor to Whole House and the primary solicitor of Whole House funding. She was also treasurer of the Whole House, and she continued this position until a few weeks or a few months before her death in 1953. Between 1895 and 1928, she contributed $15,000 annually that totaled $540,000 and she would ultimately donate over 1 million total to the whole house. Bowen joined the Juvenile Court Committee in 1899 and became the chairman of the organization by 1904. She is able to establish the Juvenile Court Building and Detention Home in Chicago. She next became president of the Juvenile Protective Association, which was established to analyze juvenile delinquency and social problems. She found that children were forced to the streets to peddle and that unsupervised children went to dance halls where there were rampant problems with drunkenness and prostitution. Bowen led a campaign for laws to be passed that would prohibit liquor sales in public dance halls and to regulate street peddling. Bowen also one of the first reformers in Chicago to became, become aware of the need for Chicago's African-American community to have an equal chance for work living conditions, and recreation. In 1913, she authored The Colored People of Chicago. This was one of the first social investigations into the social and economic conditions of African Americans in Chicago. The women's suffrage movement became a very important cause for Mrs. Bowen. She became the vice president of the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association, president of the Chicago Equal Suffrage Association, and the auditor of the National American Women Suffrage Association. Bowen asserted that women's equality with men was in sharing civic responsibilities. She labeled manifest absurd to the arguments that women would neglect their husbands and families if they were given the right to vote. Bowen's support of the women's suffrage movement got her involved in politics. In 1912, when the Republican Party refused to endorse women's suffrage, Bowen turned to the progressive party candidate Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt endorsed women's suffrage and Bowen did extensive campaigning for him in Chicago and Illinois. In 1913, women in Illinois gained the right to hold certain offices and Bowen became a progressive party candidate for Cook County Board by 1914. She unfortunately had to withdraw from this candidacy due to a serious illness at the time. She was considered the front runner though. In 1914, she resigned her presidency of the Whole House Women's Club and became president of the Women's City Club. This provided her a greater sphere of influence throughout the city. She would continue to still be the treasurer of the Whole House and would continue to be very active with Jane Addams in the organization. During World War I, in recognition of Bowen's elite social status and the key positions that she held in political and social circles, Eleanor, Illinois Governor Frank Loudon appointed her to the Illinois State Council of Defense. She was the only female member. She spearheaded the establishment of an intricate statewide organization that mobilized women for the war effort. This included registering women for war work, raising funds to finance the war, demonstrating techniques of food conservation, training women speakers to go to every part of the state to get the war effort message out, assisting women in job training and wartime employment, and training farm women to maintain their family farms. After the war, Bowen led a campaign to get women to register to vote. In 1923, there was a discussion for Louise de Coven Bowen to run for mayor of Chicago. 
Her strengths for running included her publicity as a female candidate, her appeal to the women vote, her refusal to build a political machine, and her lack of association with the Ku Klux Klan, which was in its heyday in Chicago. She decided not to run, but later said, had I been 20 years younger, I would have liked to try it. Shortly after declining to run for mayor, she was appointed the first Chicago woman, mayor, woman member of the Republican National Committee. Bowen continued her involvement with women's suffrage, and in April 1925, she chaired the eight-day Women's World Fair in Chicago. Jane Addams died in 1935, and Bowen resigned her position as president for the Juvenile Protective Association to take a more active role with the whole house and to fill the void left from her close friend. She was appointed president of whole house along with remaining treasurer of the organization. Bowen was involved in many other important organizations during her life that I passed over earlier. She was a longtime board member of the United Charities in Chicago, vice president of the organization from 1912 to 1950. And the last 20 years of Bowen's life were still very active. She continued to speak out on political issues and give her support to Republican or Democratic candidates she felt were worthy. She always continued her involvement with the whole house and she was a member of the whole house board of directors when she died at the age of 94 in 1953. She had resigned from that position of treasurer just a few months earlier. Louise DeCoven Bowen was often referred to as Chicago's first lady, the champion of the poor, angel of the downtrodden, and the social conscience of Chicago. She had great influence with helping the poor of Chicago, the women of Illinois, and underprivileged children. She is credited with getting nurses into public schools, improving hours and wages for women, gaining the first use of police women, cleaning up living conditions of the poor, and helping to eradicate sweatshops. As you probably noticed, Louise Coven Bowen was very active in the city of Chicago, and this needs to be a story about Waukegan. Now in 1911, when the whole house was continuing to grow in size and influence in Chicago, Jane Addams wanted more for the women and children of Chicago. She wanted a place in the country where the women and children of the whole house could go in the summer and on winter weekends. Adams turned to her good friend, Louise DeCoven Bowen, who wanted to do something in memory of her late husband, who had died earlier that year. Mrs. Bowen volunteered to endow a camp in his memory. The question now was where to place this camp. Mrs. Bowen and Jane Adams together traveled around mostly the western suburbs and looked at possibly close to 150 sites for the camp. On Thanksgiving Day in 1911, they took a train to Waukegan and met with Mayor Fred Buck. Mayor Buck took them to a site three miles north of the downtown of Waukegan. Mayor Buck had purchased this land with the hopes of turning it into a park for the city. In 1909, he had even created the Waukegan Park opening day. And this was a big celebration where he is hoping to entice folks to approve of this beautiful land to be a public park. Ultimately though, although folks had fun, it still did not become a park like Buck had wanted. But now, Thanksgiving Day, 1911, as Bowen and Adam stood at the edge of the ravine, looking over the 72 acres of tree-lined land, they knew that they had found their place for their summer camp. Louise de Coven Bowen purchased the land for $29,000, and today we know this land as Bowen Park, located at the corner of Sheridan and Greenwood Roads. Mrs. Bowen wanted to maintain the fam family atmosphere found at the whole house, and so she called the camp Country Club. 
She thought this would encourage the children to feel that it belonged to them and also to feel responsible for taking care of it. The Joseph Tilton Bowen Country Club was operated by the whole house. At the opening ceremonies of the club, Jane Addams spoke about her feelings on the site that they had chosen. And she said, this site was chosen because it was not only suitable but by far the most beautiful of all. In this place, all desirable things have been combined without the interference of man, although we are happy that he had long ago been permitted to add a garden, an orchard, a well surrounded by lilacs, and an interesting old house. And here in this picture that you're seeing, uh, Jane Adams is sitting at that interesting old house, the Haynes Farmhouse, uh, today, the Waukegan History Museum. When the Bowen Country Club opened in the summer of 1912, it consisted of only the farmhouse that was originally built in 1843 and a barn. In that first year, the female campers stayed in the farmhouse while the boys stayed in tents. Construction on the site started right away after the land was purchased. One of the first things that Mrs. Bowen did after purchasing the property was to bring in her personal gardener from her estate in Maine to lay out the formal gardens in the form of a maze with a sundial. The gardener also put in vegetable gardens and laid out ball fields, playgrounds, and tennis courts. The grounds of the Bowen Country Club consisted of various buildings that were built over the club's existence. The cottages where the campers stayed were named after primary contributors to the camp that Bowen herself solicited. The first buildings on the site were built in 1912. They were the Commons, Lansing Cottage, and Smith Cottage. The Commons was the largest building on the grounds. It was two stories and housed the kitchen, dining room, laundry room, director's office, and sleeping quarters for the kitchen staff. In the dining area, there were 20 tables that each sat eight campers and one counselor. Every meal was eaten on blue willow china, and each table had centerpieces of flowers. The campers were served family style, and song sessions occurred during and after the meals, and they were led by the counselors. Lansing Cottage was a two-story building for girls aged 10 to 16. 25 girls lived here with four counselors. The cottage had two dormitories, a living room with a fireplace, kitchen, and a back porch. Mary Rose Smith Cottage was a two-story cottage for girls aged 6 to 10. There were two dormitory rooms for 12 to 13 girls and four counselors each. There was a living room with the fireplace and a large screened-in back porch. Rosenwald Cottage was built in 1913. It was a two-story building for mothers and babies with six bedrooms upstairs, a large living room with the fireplace, a large kitchen, and a long sun porch. It contained 25 beds and eight cribs. By the porch, there was a covered sandbox for the babies to play in. There were two counselors who cared for the babies, but not, did not sleep in the cottage. The hospital, built in 1914, was a five-bed hospital, which had a nurse on duty 24 hours a day, and the nurse resided there as well. Goodfellow Hall, built in 1914, was the recreation hall for dances, skits, and other group activities. There was a library in this hall and also storage for sports equipment to be used on the playground and ball field that were adjacent to this building. In 1917, Hutchinson Cottage, a single-story building that housed 24 boys aged 6 to 10 and four counselors was built. There was a living room with fireplace and double-deck dormitory beds. Camp French was built in 1917. This was a one-story barracks for boys aged 10 to 16, and it was located on the other side of the ravine. 
It housed 24 campers and four counselors. There was a living room and a fireplace. Well, I'm pausing here. Just got a text from my mom saying that we were not live anymore. I don't exactly trust her, uh, her technology skills though. Still looks like we're okay. I'm going to keep going. So with Camp French, this was for the oldest boys uh, located farthest away from everybody else, probably for obvious reasons. Uh, but also this was the one facility that did not allow or did not have hot water for the showers. Probably again for obvious reasons. All right, so it looks like we did lose a little bit. Well, I'll keep going here. We've, uh, I'm just going through the list of the different facilities here. So welcome back, everybody. I had a great time while you were all gone. Uh, Pelham Cottage, built in 1925 was a two-bedroom cottage with a living room, fireplace, and kitchen used for staff members and guests. This was also referred to as the music cottage in the early days of the country club. In 1928, Lilac Cottage was built for Mrs. Bowen and Jane Adams so that they could come and go without bothering the everyday activities of the camp. It is a large, imposing colonial-style home which still stands today and currently houses the Bowen Country Club Memorabilia Room, and also the Waukegan Historical Society's Research Library. And I saw on there that Claudia Freeman uh, reminded me that yes, uh, Mrs. Bowen did like fat houses. So that's why you have uh, Lilac Cottage the way that it, it is, the way that it's built. The camp also had Greenhouses, sheds, garages, a pump house, a log cabin in the north woods, and a playhouse. Here in the picture, you're seeing some of the garages that are uh, adjacent to Lilac Cottage. Uh, the early days, uh, Mrs. Bowen liked for her automobiles to be warm when she got in them. So you'll notice the garages do have fireplaces there to externally heat those early cars. Uh, some of these garages were also for horses, too. The whole house staff and social workers chose which truly needy children and mothers could go to the camp for two weeks in the summer. There was a fee to attend, charged to remove the stigma of it being a charitable camp and to give the campers more of a sense of self-respect. In 1912, the fee was only $1 per week. Over the years of the camp's existence, the fee only ro or rose only to $20 for the two weeks. And also, no child was ever turned away for lack of money. At the end of the school year, children and mothers started to look forward to spending a part of their summer on the 72 acres of green grass, trees, bushes, and flowers instead of life on the Chicago streets. Before leaving Chicago, the children had to take a physical examination, which included checking heads for lice, feet for athlete's foot, or any other possible contagious disease, as well as for their general health. Four groups of campers went for two weeks, starting at the end of June until late August. 
Mothers and children left for camp from Northwestern Station, and their fares were donated by the Northwestern Railroad. The camp began on a Tuesday. As the train left Chicago, the campers looking out the windows of the train could see the green fields, trees, and flowers of Northern Illinois. This was a great contrast from the dirty streets and alleys that they had grown accustomed to in Chicago. And some say this was the first time that any of them had seen green outside of the Chicago. As the train came into view of the Waukegan station, a group of counselors waved and greeted the campers. The campers were helped off the train and put in groups by age. The campers then made the two mile walk from downtown Waukegan to the country club. Mothers and babies were driven in a station wagon or in the very beginning by a buggy pulled by a horse named Lady Tom, which in turn was replaced by a Model T. The citizens of Waukegan watched this scene of children walking, singing, and waving for every two weeks in the summer, and it became a ritual for the town to greet them. During an average summer, 550 campers used the camp. Each group during the two-week time periods consisted of 135 to 140 campers. The Bowen Country Club introduced campers to the beauty of nature with its formal gardens, acres of woods, and a deep ravine with a stream at its base. The campers could pick raspberries, blueberries, and crab apples. They could hike through the woods where counselors identified leaves, trees, birds, and insects. At night, the campers could stargaze and were taught about constellations. From year to year, counselors, directors, commissary department aides, cooks, counselors in trainings, and gardeners came from all over the United States and abroad and from all walks of life, including social workers, teachers, students, athletes, coaches, nurses, former campers, and volunteers. And the staff washed dishes, played in the mud, talked, laughed, and danced with the campers. The campers experienced having a bed of their own and brushing their teeth and showering on a daily basis. They ate three healthy meals a day that were all they could eat. They would eat their meals on blue willow china and follow the rules of dining etiquette. They would drink milk with every meal. The campers were required to make their beds and keep their clothes clean, and they were responsible for sweeping the floors of their cottage. These activities were required to promote self-pride and responsibility for themselves and for their surroundings. Manners were important, especially at the recreation hall for music and dancing. All campers from the smallest to the oldest went to Goodfellow Hall for dancing. The boys seated on one side with the girls sitting on the other. When the cottage name was called, the residents would get up, walk across the room and politely ask, May I have this dance? No one was ever allowed to refuse, and everyone had a partner, even if it was with a counselor. A favorite activity of the campers was swimming. The first swimming pool built in the early days was a concrete in-ground pool with a steel-like fence around it and a makeshift diving board. The second pool was built in 1951 and was brought up to health and safety standards. Other activities that the campers participated in included reciting the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, tacky parties, a carnival, folk dancing, campfires, peanut hunt, track meets, 4th of July celebration, wishing boat ceremonies at the pool, and that's just to name a few. Every Sunday, the campers and their counselors would gather for church services. The Catholic children would walk to the Catholic church. The mothers would be driven. The Protestant children would go to the Protestant church and other denominations would meet at Goodfellow Hall for their own private ceremonies. Every group would publish its own newspaper. Campers wrote all of the stories, which were taken from the activities that they participated in while they were at camp. At the end of the two-week period, the paper was printed and given to the campers to take home. In the 50-year existence, 
of the Bone Country Club, there were only three sets of directors. Thora Lund from 1912 to 1938, Mr. Robert and Mrs. Ada Hicks from 1938 to 1958, and Mr. Robert Mulligan from 1958 to 1962. In 1955, the Bone Country Club started having sewage problems and caused the property to not be sanitary for a period of time. And this continued to be a problem for the camp for the next couple of years until it connected to the North Shore Sanitary District. In 1963, Mr. and Mrs. Mulligan, directors of the Bone Country Club, notified the Waukegan Park District that the whole house was going to sell the Bowen Country Club. The whole house felt that the camp had become too urbanized and it was decided to move the summer camp to Wisconsin. The Waukegan Park District purchased the land for $370,000. The Park District eventually turned the site into Bowen Park. Not all of the original buildings survive, survived the 50 years of heavy use, but enough of the Bowen Country Club remained to secure listing of this land to the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. Louise de Coven Bowen took a vested interest in the club that she started for the whole house and named in honor of her late husband. Every summer, Mrs. Bowen lived at Lilac Cottage and she made occasional stays during weekends and also in the winter, or during the winter. She enjoyed spending time with the children and participating in some of the fun, more subdued events that were planned. A favorite an event for her at the camp, well, the children would walk up the hill to Lilac Cottage, where Mrs. Bowen would be sitting on the sun porch waiting for them. And the children would stand outside the window and serenade her. The Bone Country Club had profound effects on the underprivileged children of Chicago. To this day, former campers come back to visit and reminisce. There have been Bone Country Club reunions in the past as well. Of all the important things that Louise de Coven Bowen had done during her life, she considered the Bone Country Club to be one of her finest achievements, which brought her so much joy and pride. And I will conclude today with the words of a seven-year-old boy who is dying of a heart problem, who was given the chance to enjoy the Bowen Country Club. This boy said to his mother upon returning from the camp, if heaven is anything like the Bowen Country Club, then when it is time, I am ready to go. Everyone, thank you for joining me on another Waukegan History Museum Lunch and Learn. We will do this again next Friday at noon with Waukegan baseball stories. I know I'm missing not having baseball to watch right now, so I'll be sharing some of our fun baseball uh, heritage with you all uh, next Friday. I will see you again in the future to talk about the past. This is Ty Rohr from Waukegan signing off. Again, thanks for joining.